on the first annual rule of law report by the Commission on the role of national parliaments. Are we to go right away or to maybe spare some minutes? Do we go right away? Okay, then we do. We move on. Right away. First of all, I would like to welcome the participants in this important gathering, which is some kind of an institutional, some kind of a, a institutional convention by now, because we have set forth a number of practices so far of the cooperational work of this exercise of cooperation between European Parliament and national parliaments regarding the area of liberty, justice, and security, the most relevant issues for some years now, ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force and along with the Lisbon Treaty entered the area of liberty, justice, and security, Title V of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union and the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which are our jurisdiction. And uh, so we are somehow here uh, uh, abiding by, by the principle, by, by the mandate that we should learn to work together and do it better and work better together. And that's precisely the point here. So we're going to try. So please be welcome all the representatives of the European Parliament and all the representatives of the National Parliament. And if you may, a most warm welcome to our Vice Chair of the Libre Committee, Maite Pagasa Ortundua. I never thought it would bring me such joy <laughs> to, see, to see another member physically present here in the room of the, <laughs> of the, of the sitting room of the, of the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Security. I'm so, I'm so happy to see you back on your, on your seat. Let's, let's now get to work. As I said, welcome everybody, guest speakers especially, because they are about to have the floor, and it is our honor to chair and open this interparliamentary conference on the first annual rule of law report on the Commission and the role of the national parliaments. We are here represented nothing less than 51 members of national parliaments and houses, parliamentary houses across the member states of the European Union, coming from 23 different member states, which is one a clear indication of the interest of national parliaments in this kind of debates and exercises that we have been establishing as a convention here in the European Parliament. National uh, parliaments and uh, European Parliament are to exchange views and promoting safeguards and common values, which is of the utmost importance for the work that we have to carry out, and particularly when it comes to advancing the debate about the role of the Union, Member States, and National Parliaments in this regard. Since 2016, let me remind you, the European Parliament has been calling for a comprehensive and preventive mechanism in the field of rule of law via a mechanism on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights, what is being called rule of law framework, rule of law mechanism, whatever. This is the point. This is the idea. October the 2020, this European Parliament adopted a new resolution establishing the so-called EU mechanism on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights, calling for a wide-ranging, wide-ranging mechanism to be governed by an interinstitutional agreement. Those who are encompassed in the treaties, Article 17, particularly between the Parliament, Council, and the Commission. In the context of this proposed annual monetary cycle on union values, the European Parliament stressed this crucial point, critical point, on the role of national parliaments and encouraged them to hold public debates and adopt specific and public positions on the outcome of the rule of law monitoring cycle. The organization of this parliamentary meeting, such as this one we are about to have, are hence part of this dialogue and debates the European Parliament intends to promote regularly. So our meeting today will be devoted to an assessment of the first annual rule of law report 
which was adopted by the European Commission and presented by the European Commissioner of Justice, Didier Reinders, before this Libe Committee, 30th September 2020. In the context of this mechanism proposed by the European Parliament. There will be a second panel, though, and that second panel this afternoon will be dealing with the opportunity to discuss the impact of COVID-19 measures, the so-called COVID-19 emergency measures that have been adopted by the member states as to their impact on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights with a particular focus on the scrutiny exercised by the national parliaments throughout this period of time. So I'm pleased to open the first session today, which will be dedicated to exchange of views on the Commission annual report and future steps towards a mechanism on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights. We've got a number of speakers, all of them distinguished. First, we're welcoming Katarina Barlai, which is Vice President of this European Parliament. Then, Michael Roth, which is the Minister of State for Europe of the Deutsche Bundesregierung. Then it'll be Mr. Didier Reinders, our Commissioner for Justice. Michael Smeka, Rapporteur on the Mechanism on Democracy, Rule of Law, and Fundamental Rights. And we will also have the opportunity to enjoy the contributions of two members of national parliaments and uh, uh, that will be Mrs. Isabel Rodriguez, Portugal, and Herbert Irte, and Mrs. Klaus Christian Clausen from Germany. So let's get started. First floor will go to Katarina Barlai, maximum scheduled 10 minutes, but I suggest if you can make it less than that, some eight minutes, because, wow, we've got here at least five guest speakers in a row or more. Mm -hmm. Oh, if we, if, we, if we contain ourselves to the uh, minima minimorum, if we contain ourselves to a summarized to version a summarized of our speaking time, our that'll speaking help time, that'll to help make the best of this available of time. Available Thank you. Time. Katarina, we saw you. Please be back. <laughs> yes, I'm back, I'm back. Hello, Juan, welcome to all the participants. Um, on behalf of President Sassoli, I'm very honored uh, to be able to welcome you um, to this uh, interparliamentary committee meeting on the first annual um, rule of law report and the role of the national parliaments. Having been a national parliamentary myself and a shadow rapporteur on, on this annual rule of law report, it's, it's uh, even more of an honor. Um, as you well know, the European Parliament, uh, for us, the defense of the rule of law um, and the values of the EU and enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty um, on European Union are of essential importance. While there is no hierarchy uh, within the Union values, respect for the rule of law is a prerequisite for the protection of the other fundamental values on which the Union is founded, such as freedom, democracy, equality, and respect for human rights. Respect for the rule of law is intrinsically linked to respect for democracy and for fundamental rights. There can be no democracy and respect for fundamental rights without respect for the rule of law and vice versa. However, the questions around the rule of law um, offer interesting debates that I'm sure we will have during our meeting today. How do uh, we think concretely of democracy and the rule of law as reciprocal, uh, reciprocal conditionalities? How to acknowledge the political, economic and social framework of law, the fruitful political dynamics of the conflict between majorities, minorities, etc.? Debates like this today are much needed. Sadly, today in Europe, we must not only discuss the rule of law, but we also have to actively defend it. The history of democracy is a permanent search of the right balance to limit the powers of the powerful through a system of checks and balances where the citizens are the sovereign power. The European Parliament welcomes the first annual rule of law report by the European Commission covering the situation in, in all EU member states. 
The European Parliament has been long time advocating for the establishment of such a mechanism. And the national parliaments are key in the defense of the rule of law in our union. So I'm sure our meeting today will be very fruitful. The Commission's report represents a thorough, objective and complete map of the situation of the rule of law in the entire European Union. We're, we think that this report is going into the right direction with the setting up of a system of monitoring the rule of law developments in the member states with a rule of law review cycle. The Commission has focused on corruption, media freedom, independence of judiciary mainly, but the Parliament has repeatedly called for a monetary mechanism to cover the full scope of Article 2. The Parliament has recently put into the, on, onto the table its vision for the future and has also reiterated the need for an objective and evidence-based monitoring mechanism with a more comprehensive mechanism, assessing also, also the threats to democracy and to fundamental rights, as these values cannot be dissociated from upholding the rule of law. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has also raised important questions on the impact of the measures taken on democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights in our member states. Many parliaments were and still are today facing challenges in exercising their roles, especially in the context of emergency measures. Our common action is fundamental to maintain the rule of law. The European Parliament has been closely following the impact of measures adopted by member states to fight the COVID-19 pandemic on democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights. In this regard, the European Parliament considers that all measures taken at national and or European level must be in line with the rule of law, strictly proportionate to the needs of the situation, clearly related to the ongoing health crisis, limited in time and subjected to regular scrutiny. The European Parliament initiated in 2018 a reasoned proposal pursuant to Article 7 of the Treaty as regards the situation of the rule of law in Hungary. In addition, our Parliament also supported via resolutions adopted in a similar procedure initiated by the Commission as regards to the situation in Poland, which was followed by with an interim report related to this procedure recently adopted. However, already in January, the Parliament adopted resolu a resolution where it underlined that the current procedures have not yet resulted in significant progress by the two member states with regard to redressing clear risks of serious breach of the values referred to in Article 2. I welcome the efforts by the current Council Presidency to continue its work and address the situation of the rule of law in the framework of the procedures based on Article 7. We have to be conscious that the serious lack of progress in the Article 7 proceedings might undermine mutual trust and the credibility of the EU as a whole. Therefore, I would reiterate the call for the EU common values to be properly defended and discussed in the framework provided by the treaties and with the presence of the European Parliament when it is the Parliament that initiated this procedure. Last week, a provisional agreement was reached between the Parliament and the Council for a regime of conditionality for the protection of the Union budget. The European Parliament strongly defends the principle and effectivity of conditionality within the mutual annual, multi-annual framework, financial framework as a precondition for an effective EU policy in upholding the Union values. Respect for the rule of law is also essential for the proper functioning of the internal market, for flourishing businesses, for growing innovation and investment, and for the economic, social and territorial cohesion in our member states. We are pleased that the rule of law has been defined in a broad manner with reference to, our, to the Article 2 Treaty in this respect. This is one only possible when a solid legal and institutional framework is in place and it exists and effective judicial protection within independent courts. Sound financial management can only be ensured by the member states if public authorities act in accordance with the rule of law, and if cases of fraud are effectively pursued, and if arbitrary or unlawful decisions of public authorities can be subject to effective judicial review by independent courts and by the Court of Justice of the European Union. The notion of rule of law has been part of the normative and institutional DNA of what is today the European Union. Since the inception of the current integration process in the aftermath of World War II, 
We need to continue in this path. Today, we face a defining moment in the history of integration where we need to stand up for the values that we share in order to understand that what brings us together remains stronger than what differentiates us. Allow me to close my intervention by thanking you for your presence again in this meeting. The European Parliament counts on your strong participation. Thank you very much. We thank you, Katarina, for your contribution. Now it's time to hear from Michael Roth, our dear Minister for Europe, the Deutsche President of the European Union. Sie haben das Wort. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Thank you very much, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues from the European Parliament and from national parliaments, thank you very much for having invited me today. I really appreciate this because it's important that the rule of law is something that we uh, start to concentrate on properly in the European Union. The rule of law all too often is a divisive issue, but we have to do our best to ensure that the institutions in Europe, the Parliament, the Council and the Commission, uh, have to do their part. And the Council plays a, a particular role in this, as, well, as do national parliaments. But we need to improve our cooperation on these issues. I can only agree with Vice President Barley. The rule of law is not an extra. Without the rule of law, everything else... It doesn't work. We are a community of rights and values and the law. And these rights and laws have to apply to everyone equally. So the task is to bring us together on this very controversial and sensitive subject. The German Council Presidency has made strengthening and protecting the rule of law to one of its priorities. We have ensured that it is high up on our agenda. Early on, right from the outset, indeed, we called for two new instruments. One of those we've touched upon already, the new rule of law mechanism in the budget. That opens up an opportunity. Wherever the rules of uh, the rule of law are systematically uh, violated, then we have uh, uh, measures that we can take. The second new instrument is the so-called rule of law dialogue. Commissioner Didier Reinders, when he was the foreign minister of Belgium, uh, knows very well about how much progress we've made, and we're now making major steps forwards in the rule of law dialogue in the Council. We are now discussing the annual rule of law report from the Council. We see this as very valuable and we would like to thank the Commission for it. It provides an objective basis for open, constructive debate. So far, we've only had the Article 7 uh, procedure. Now we have the rule of law mechanism in the budget. And on top of that, the, we have the rule of law dialogue. But that's different from the other two instruments because it is a preventative instrument. What we want to do is to heal. Heal the disease before it has become so serious that we can no longer control it. We need a common understanding of what the rule of law means, and we want to avoid a situation where uh, individual countries find that they are constantly uh, being examined by the Council. No, we need to ensure that all member states are subject to uh, scrutiny when it comes to the rule of law. And what I'd really like to stress is positive in the Commission report is that it has not only been put together by experts in, Brus in Brussels within the uh, uh, Berlaymont building. No, rather it's uh, a report that has been put together talking to different players in the countries concerned and civil society as well. In the Council, we've agreed on a mechanism, a dialogue that's made up of two elements. 
last week at the last physical meeting of the Council of the uh, Europe Ministers, we talked about the situation with the rule of law. We did this on the basis of the report, four elements, checks and balance, the fight against corruption, the independence of the judiciary and media pluralism and freedom. Next week, the Council will be uh, meeting once again with the Europe Ministers and we are going to be continuing the rule of law dialogue. There are going to be a series of member states that are going to be uh, looked at. We can't deal with all member states uh, with the same level of detail, but we have agreed on a procedure. Every semester, let's say every half year, five member states are going to be looked at in depth. We're going to do that in the alphabetical order. So Belgium, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Denmark and Estonia are coming first. It's our hope that we'll be able to talk uh, not only about the things that uh, don't work, but we are also looking for best practice so that we can learn from each other and learn together. That's an important aspect of the dialogue. When we're talking about issues like the independence of the judiciary, it's important that we can uh, talk about these issues with our partners. That's the approach that we're trying to pursue. And the Commission's rule of law report is at the foundation of all of this. We want to ensure that we are able to talk about... Uh, things that are going the wrong way at a very early stage so that we're in a position to correct things that are going the wrong way. So, you're members of the European Parliament or national parliaments, uh, but you understand that we all have to do our part as the institutions. The German Council presidency wants to build the foundations for strengthening the rule of law in the EU. And I'm pleased to be able to tell you that the upcoming pre council presidencies, Portugal, Slovenia and France, have all agreed that they will continue this process. It will take place three times a year in the council. There will be uh, in-depth discussions on the rule of law in individual countries. And the uh, Council also has an important role to play in the rule of law mechanism. So this will all be interconnected. But I'd also like to thank the European Parliament. It's thanks to the Parliament that we've been able to put this subject so high on the agenda. And I'd also like to thank the national parliaments who have also uh, been contributing and will contribute to the EU's efforts to be credible as a community of law and values. We have to state very clearly what is a national tradition and national difference, but where do we draw the border to having a common basis under the EU treaties? Thank you very much. Michael Roth, vielen Dank für Ihre Rede. Now we move to Didier Reinders, our Commissioner for Justice. There you go, Mr. Reiner, seven, eight minutes, because after all, we're discussing your first annual report for good reason. So let's hear from you. Make your case, please. Commissioner? I, there. I try. Okay, fine. It's okay. It's okay, Chair. And good afternoon to all the participants. I want first to warmly welcome uh, such an initiative to invite uh, the Commission to present the first annual report on the rule of law again in the Libe Committee with, with the, the National Parliament. And the Commission has engaged closely with the European Parliament, in particular uh, the Libe Committee, on the setting up of uh, a rule of law mechanism. Uh, now that the first ever annual report um, has been published, I have the firm intention to bring the political debate on the rule of law to all European capitals, uh, notably before national parliaments, but also with national civil society. I have already presented uh, the report to the German Bundestag, 
and to the Cossack, and will soon present it to the Danish Parliament and the French Assemblée Nationale, among others. By June 2021, I intend to go to all national parliaments to present the report and discuss the perspective of uh, the different country chapters in the different respective uh, member states. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of your role as elected members of parliament in safeguarding uh, the rule of law. As you know, the rule of law is a fundamental value of the Union and an essential element to ensure social peace and prosperity. We have to work to defend it and strengthen it every day. That is why we conceive this mechanism to prevent rule of law problems from emerging or deepening. It will create joint awareness on the situation of the rule of law across the EU and keep this topic eyed on the uh, political agenda. To set up this mechanism in January this year, I wrote to all 27 ministers of foreign uh, European affairs uh, to establish a network of national contact points. We also carry out a targeted stakeholder consultation where over 200 stakeholders provided written input. We conducted more than 300 virtual country visits, meeting with uh, member states, national authorities, notably judicial and other independent authorities. We also met with relevant stakeholders, such as journalist associations. Um, last but not least, every member state had the opportunity to check its draft country chapter for factual accuracy. It was important for us, uh, and um, of course the close involvement of all the member states on an equal footing is uh, a fundamental principle in the uh, elaboration of such uh, a report on the rule of law. In that respect, I want to stress that our assessment has been informed by widely recognized standards, such as those of the Council of Europe and also refers to EU law requirements, including the rulings from the Open Court of Justice. We made sure that this process was robust, transparent, and as inclusive as possible. But let me also be clear that this report represents the Commission's own assessment. The report provides a synthesis of significant rule of law development since 2019 in the European Union, as well as country-specific assessments of positive and negative developments for all the member states. In the report, we looked at four key areas, the independence, equality, and efficiency of justice system, the anti-corruption framework, media pluralism and media freedom, order institutional checks and balances. Firstly, on the justice systems, I'm pleased to see that a number of member states are making, are making a force to strengthen judicial independence and reduce the influence of the executive or legislative powers over the judiciary. But it's also true that judicial independence remains an issue of concern in certain member states. This includes structural concerns over an increasing influence of the executive and legislative branches on the functioning of the justice systems. In terms of quality of justice, the current pandemic has highlighted the importance to accelerate also the digitalization of justice. Investing in justice is therefore more necessary than ever. Regarding the anti-corruption framework, I appreciate that several member states have recently adopted new comprehensive anti-corruption strategies or revised existing ones. What will, however, be key is that these strategies are effectively implemented and monitored to ensure that progress is made on the ground. Our monitoring also shows concerns in several member states about the effectiveness of the litigation, prosecution, and adjudication of corruption cases, notably high-level cases. Thirdly, on media pluralism and media freedom, an encouraging finding is that the independence of media authorities is enshrined in law in every member state. That being said, there are worrying signs in some of them with regards to the political influence on the media, a lack of transparency when it comes to media ownership, and risks to journalists and other media actors. 
The fourth area of the report concerns institutional checks and balances, where national parliaments play a central role. The COVID-19 pandemic has sometimes provided good examples of functioning checks and balances. Parliamentary scrutiny helps frame certain emergency response. However, we also identified a number of concerns with regard to checks and balances. In a few member states, we see repeated recourse to expedited legislation in Parliament or to emergency ordinances from the government. This situation raises concerns. Across the European Union, civil society continues to be a key actor in defending the rule of law. However, in some member states, it operates in an unstable environment and is facing challenges such as legislation challenging access to foreign funding or smear campaign. Now that the report is out, we need consistent dialogue at EU and national level. As you have heard from Minister Roth, the General Affairs Council has already discussed the, the horizontal findings of the report in October and will have country-specific discussions as well next week on the first series of five member states. I trust that it will be possible to do the same with the future presidencies so that we can cover all the 27 member states. I look forward to our future cooperation with the upcoming Portuguese and Slovenian presidencies and then the French presidency. I would also like to continue these discussions with the European Parliament and the Libé Committee on the individual country chapters. We already discussed the horizontal findings of the report, both in Libé and in the plenary. So I'm now looking forward to discuss the country chapters with the European Parliament, as we are doing in the Council. As I mentioned, I also intend to have discussions with national parliaments and stakeholders from all the member states. I recently had a very good discussion with the European Affairs and Justice Committees of the German Bundestag, and I will be with the Danish Parliament this Thursday. I hope that other opportunities uh, will follow, for instance, with the Assembly of Portugal in view of the upcoming Portuguese presidency. Let me also take this occasion to say that the Commission welcomes the political compromise found between the European Parliament and the Council on the Commission's proposal uh, linking the use of EU funds and the respect for the rule of law in the member states. The Commission has been strongly advocating for such a mechanism. This is an important step forward that the Commission now expects to see it formally endorsed an effective role of law conditionality is important to protect both the EU budget and the funding under the next generation EU. And I want to say that we will continue to use all the tools at our disposal, so we will continue to proceed with Article 7, with infringement proceedings, with a dialogue with all the member states, the new annual report, and maybe later the conditionality with uh, the EU budget. And I'm I'm hoping that it will be possible with the support of the members of the European Parliament and of the national parliament to continue to organize a permanent dialogue in the member states about the rule of law to install a real culture of the rule of law in the entire European Union. I thank you for your, your attention. I'm looking forward also to hearing your remarks and questions, but thanks again for such an opportunity to explain the, the report, the first ever report on the rule of law to all the participants from the European Parliament and the national parliaments. Thank you, Didier. We thank you for your work, for your presentation, and of course for your input into this issue of the relevance, which I cannot exaggerate, because it's of the utmost importance, not only for the European Parliament, but also for the scrutiny powers that are to be exerted by all of the national parliaments when it comes to values, democracy, fundamental rights, rule of law, all of them included, but also as to the impact upon those values by the emergency measures that have been adopted throughout the COVID-19 protracted crisis. So let's move on to the following point, which is Schmecker, Michael Schmecker, Rapporteur for the Mechanism on Democracy, Rule of Law and Fundamental Rights. You are connected. Make it. Michael, yeah, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to join uh, also you and others in thanking um, Commissioner Reinders for his work uh, during this very challenging year and the work that has led to the successful publication of the first annual rule of law report. And equally, I'd like to commend uh, Minister Roth for his, for his efforts to bring uh, this discussion uh, of the report and more generally the discussion of the rule of law to the Council. Uh, and we all know that it's not an easy feat. Uh, and of course, it's vital that the uh, EU continues to promote this agenda in all its institutions to live up to its reputation as a guarantor of democracy and rule of law in Europe. And we must remember that uh, millions of Europeans look to the EU with the hope that it will safeguard their rights, their freedoms against what we're seeing uh, is creeping authoritarianism and illiberalism. But of course, you know, it cannot uh, all be done from Brussels. It must be done in cooperation, and it can only succeed in dialogue and cooperation with national parliaments. And national parliamentarians must be able to lean on European institutions in defense of democracy and rule of law in their respective member states. Now, of course, at this moment, um, I cannot fail to mention, the, as, as others uh, have, the preliminary agreement on the budgetary conditionality reached last week. Uh, as, as have others before me, I also think it's a crucial step forward. Uh, and it's also important that the text of the regulation, as it stands in the compromise, mentions the annual report as, uh, as a source uh, on the basis of which the conditionality mechanism uh, might be triggered. I think this is, this is very important, and I think it also goes in the direction of the European uh, Parliament's position, because these regular and objective analyses of country situations are the most legitimate foundation for, for any enforcement action, including under this conditionality tool. Nonetheless, I'd like to say that the, the link between uh, the regulation and the annual report also raises the question uh, of why the letter, that the annual report, is not actually enshrined in law. Because, uh, as uh, many of you know, the, uh, the European Parliament, in, um, in, in its resolution last month, called on the Commission and the Council uh, to take up uh, our proposal to negotiate an interinstitutional agreement that would protect this monitoring exercise as a matter of law. And this is not just a technicality. Um, the codification of this annual report and the follow-up in an interinstitutional agreement would ensure that regardless of who holds the presidency or who manages the justice portfolio in the Commission, this monitoring would not be undermined. And we should also have no illusions that there are many who would like to see uh, this rule of law monitoring falter or be compromised, which is why I believe we should act now to secure the future uh, of, of this monitoring and of our values as part of the EU's agenda. Uh, I'd also like to mention um, one other important issue, which is that, um, and also recent events have highlighted the importance of a more holistic approach to, to monitoring. Um, and this is also what Katarina Barley mentioned. Just take the example of, of Poland and the recent protests there. You have a constitutional tribunal whose integrity was compromised, as the Commission itself is well aware, uh, and it has de facto banned 98 percent of legally available abortions in Poland. And Polish women rightly expect the EU to protect their rights, which also suggests that the EU's values, and should be clear by now, is more than just the rule of law, because the member states have also committed themselves to the respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, and human rights, which is why the Parliament firmly believes and uh, has voted so in the in the resolution that the monitoring, the annual uh, monitoring, should reflect the full scope of Article 2. Therefore, in conclusion, let me also use this opportunity to reiterate the Parliament's invitation for the Commission and the Council to open negotiation on an agreement, on an interinstitutional agreement that will make the protection of European values more durable. Excuse me, Michal, we have lost you. Can you reconnect the mic? Can you reconnect, please? Because we lost Sorry, you. Uh, yeah, the, now, now you're back. Yep, if you, if you may conclude, we were listening. We were listening, Michal. If you may conclude. Mr. Chairman, the, my, my connection seemed to have uh, seemed to have fell down. Uh, but uh, at any rate, I was just going to to conclude by uh, by saying that uh, uh, well, the Parliament's 
uh, has extended an invitation for the Council and the Commission to open those negotiations on the interinstitutional agreement to make the protection of European values durable and comprehensive. And this is what we should do also for those thousands of people in the streets from Poland to Bulgaria uh, to show them that the EU cares about the core principles underpinning uh, our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That'll do for now. Now let's hear to distinguish um, some distinguished members of the national parliaments which are represented in this gathering. We get started welcoming Mrs. Isabel Rodriguez, member of the Committee of Constitutional Affairs, Assembleia da República de Portugal. Can you make it in three minutes? Are you there connected? Will you? Isabel? Please take the floor. Press and speak. Yes, yes, you are. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, I'd also like to uh, send a fraternal greeting to uh, uh, all of the, those taking part in this meeting today. And I'd like to welcome the uh, report from the Commission. It's a useful instrument, and it's going to help us with the work that we're trying to do. We need to uh, exhaust all of the uh, possible options uh, uh, by the European Union institutions, particularly when the rule of law is endangered, which is, uh, in many cases, the conclusion that we see from this report. So it's important that we need to work harder on deepening the rule of law. It's essential if the EU is to survive with also being faithful to its values. We note serious threats in some countries identified in the report. And we think it's only correct that there should be conditionality in terms of access to European funds. Abuses of the rule of law by member states is not something we can accept. The EU needs to react firmly and uh, strictly. Those who create a rule of law crisis should uh, uh, realize that there are consequences. And we need to act early to prevent these situations from developing. Without going into the situations in individual member states, I could identify two threats that affect citizens' trusts in the institutions and therefore weakens democracy and brings with it the danger of dangerous populism and corruption. When we're talking about corruption, it's important for member states to continue to bolster their uh, corruption and combating mechanisms, but the population has to uh, express its support for these measures too. There's another measure which I think is very important, and that is the question of disinformation. I don't think it's sufficient to guarantee the freedom and pluralism of the media. We're in a period of time when the media are in a difficult situation in economic terms, particularly given the pandemic. I want to draw your attention to the situation of the, man, the, the media, general media and local media. And I think that the European Union needs to make an additional effort to support the member states. We need to ensure that uh, citizens have access to information. Democracy will only survive if we are able to ensure the trust of our citizens in the European institutions and national institutions. Herbert Hirte, German Bundestag, the Deutsche Bundestag. When Sie is vorbereiten. If you're prepared to take the floor, you have, uh, you have the floor, sir. We hören Sie. Herr Hirte. Ah, I had to press it twice. Now I'm with you. So I'd like to wish everyone a good afternoon. As the chair of the subcommittee on European law, we've dealt with the issue of the rule of law uh, from uh, for quite some time now. 
And I very much welcome it that the Commission has uh, produced a very high-quality report. In the subcommittee, we discussed the uh, Commission's report. There was a lot of support, but there were some criticisms. In some points, it seemed that some of the individual uh, country reports were put together or copy-pasted from other sources. But nevertheless, it's important we have a common understanding of these principles. We have different approaches to the rule of law, and we need to uh, look into them. One key issue is the independence of state prosecution services. In Germany, there are issues there, and this has been brought before the uh, European Court of Justice. But there are different viewpoints on that front. Then we have the question of the independence of the European Central Bank. Now, of course, independent institutions do need, in some form or other, to be subject to democratic scrutiny. In Germany, in the subcommittee, we have been discussing how we can uh, deal with uh, job changes of high-level judges. This is an element that wasn't included in the report. And then we have the register of lobbyists in Germany. Shouldn't the judicial system also be subject to these kind of transparency measures to, when they are uh, subject to lobbying? They create law just as parliamentarians do. It's important that we discuss all of these issues and come to a common conclusion. The Legal Affairs Committee of the Bundestag have been spoke, speaking to uh, representatives from Kosovo and Albania, and we realise just how important it is to have a common concept of the rule of law. As for the PSPP uh, purchase programme is concerned, then we do need to uh, look into the links between this programme and European law. So, independence of the press is important. Transparency of economic influences is important too. We see recently that uh, the legal specialised press has been subject to this kind of influence. Thank you very much. Danach wir hören Herr Klaus Christian Clausen. Klaus Christian Clausen from the German Bundesrat, German Upper House. You have the floor. Sie ist vorbereiten. Herr Clausen? Mr. Clausen, are you ready? Sind Sie da? Wir brauchen Sie Speak Bottom. Speak Bottom und Video. Yeah. Biden, das ist okay. Now we hören Sie. We... we can hear you and we can see you now, sir. Sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender, meine sehr geehrten. Well, that's excellent. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part in this meeting. I am a, a Europe minister and also a legal affairs minister in my Bundesland in Germany. I was very much looking forward to the publication of the Commission's annual rule of law report in Schleswig-Holstein, my region. We uh, uh, we're very keen to uh, look at these issues. We carried out an event in our uh, regional capital, and we note that the approach behind the rule of law mechanism is correct. We need to look into this in greater deep detail. What is the rule of law? It's clear that this is a fundamental value, but it can be interpreted differently. There are different legal traditions. There are different... Uh, uh, historical contexts. So we certainly do need to discuss these issues. This uh, debate among the member states on the basis of the rule of law report from the Commission can be helpful. 
And we have to be open and honest. That's the spirit in which we have to enter into this process of dialogue. But that means that when we're setting international standards, some member states need uh, to be looked at without being subjected to uh, special uh, attention or double standards. So we certainly need to catch up with the digitalization of justice, as the Commission states. But in the debate uh, within the Council, we feel that the process should bring new discoveries to all member states. It gives an opportunity to learn from each other and to identify challenges at an early stage. I could also refer you to the latest decision of the Bundesrat, the German upper house, where we uh, uh, issued an opinion in response to the uh, annual rule of law report. We s call clearly for this dialogue to lead to genuine improvements in the rule of law uh, in individual member states. And we want to raise awareness of uh, problematic developments. Now, we have the, the right balance to be achieved between the rule of law mechanism and, that's to say, the preventative and the uh, sanction sides of the problem. We have to uh, remember that prevention is better than cure. We need to use all instruments available to us, including the uh, treaty violation proceedings, the Article 7 procedure in particular, and uh, in our regional parliament... We have uh, called for improvements in this area, and we were, would welcome the European Parliament's position. We hope that the uh, compromise will have a broad scope for rule of law conditionality. It's not just a question of uh, misuse of EU money and fraud, but rather we need to be looking at uh, attacks on the independence of the judiciary. The Commission has produced a comprehensive study, and despite a lot of positive developments, the rule of law is under pressure. So we need to do everything we can together to make this rule of law mechanism work. We need rule of law conditionality that's worthy of the name. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Now we move to the opening floor for the members willing to make their contributions. But I can only suggest that we please try to have in mind that we are having this situation, this condition, these COVID conditions which is affecting us so badly. That means in practice that uh, we've got to refrain ourselves to one minute and a half the members of the national parliaments, and one minute the members of the European Parliament, considering that the members of the European Parliament are here on a regular basis and the national parliaments are to enlighten somehow the discussion and to, to, to uh, reinvigorate the uh, exchange of views which is at stake here. So please, let's get started with the first two participants, which are members of the national parliaments. It'll be, first of all, Vincent Brou, de l'Assemblée nationale française, and then after it'll be Demetris Demetri, Demetri, which is vice chair of the Committee of Legal Affairs of the... Yes, yes. Vincent Brou, <laughs> I, was, I was announcing just to let know the following speaker that he or she should be ready. It will be Demetris Demetriou after you. So please, Vincent Vroux, vous avez la parole. Monsieur Vroux, vous étiez là, on vous écoutait. Essayez de vous reconnecter. Vous êtes connecté Monsieur Vroux, oui, yeah. merci, merci. Oui, merci, merci. Vincent Bru is having some connection problems. I am his parliamentary assistant, and he asked me to read out the following statement. 
Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, members of the European Parliament, colleagues from national parliaments, first of all, allow me to pay tribute to the initiative of the European Parliament for having organized such a meeting, which enables us, despite the uh, health conditions, uh, to have an exchange of views on the essential issue of the rule of law in the European Union. I'd also like to welcome the uh, report of the European Commission on the subject, which is essential if we're to make progress, and to establish links between uh, the European institutions and the whole question of the conditionality of uh, uh, funds. Um, conditionality is a, a crucial and definitions are necessary for that conditionality to be established. Uh, we are, after all, a, a community of values and we have identified now the principal values, which means that we can work on uh, the uh, rule of law based on four pillars. We have ongoing exchange with all the members States, and this report deals with the rule of law, places the rule of law at the heart of the building of Europe. The European Commission's report shows that the future mechanism on conditionality will not solve everything. Um, it is a means to establish, to reach our end. Now, we know that every day there are uh, problems. We have to try to contend with the situation. The situation of universities in Hungary, for instance, they're fighting on a daily basis to defend their independence. The journalists in Hungary and Poland have less and less margin for manoeuvre to carry out their investigations, which are essential in a democracy. Certain judges, too, in Hungary have been eliminated, and this, too, uh, is very... Uh, uh, Worrying, and there are certain problems also in some cities of Poland. We must try to call a spade a spade and say what we see, what we observe, and continue to fight for our fundamental values, which we're all very uh, keen on. We must also be very specific and precise in legal terms as well. This is important for the future of our continent. Please, Cyprus, are you there? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, one minute and a half, please. You were connected. We could see you. Try again. European Parliament and its particular... Try better. <laughs> please. We, were, we could see you. We could hear you. Now, now, there you are. Go ahead. Okay. I wish to thank the European Parliament and in particular Mr. Lore Lopez Aguilar for organizing the Interparliamentary Committee meeting, as well as Commissioner Raiders and uh, Mr. Ruth for being with us today. Interparliamentary dialogue on matters related to the rule of law and fundamental rights in the framework of the Union is of utmost importance. We are all aware that the rule of law constitutes a fundamental pillar on every democratic society and a core value of the Union and its member states. National parliaments must strive toward, towards a coherent and uniform application of its principle across the Union. This effort should be made in coordination with the aim of working and upholding our European identity based on uh, unicoval respect of citizens' rights and freedoms. We must conduct an evaluation of the rule of law at national level on a regular and systematic basis. This will ensure that deficits in the protection of the rule of law are addressed timely. The annual rule of law reports by European Commission make a substantial contribution in this regard by providing national institutions and stakeholders with relevant information and finding one core aspect, aspect of democracy. The four pillars that compri comprise the subject matters of the report, namely the administration of justice, corruption, media, institution checks and balances, should be revisited frequently by policymakers to ensure that the independence, integrity, and functioning of the key players are, and institutions are guaranteed by conducting an information-based evaluation of developments in these areas, the report may serve as the starting point of the engagement of the rule of law through reforms. 
Consequently, parliamentarians must take due account of the conclusion of the report. It is furthermore crucial that civil society and institutional across be properly informed about the results of the research conducted by the Commission in the framework of the report. This process must begin at the level of parli parliaments. As far as Cyprus is concerned, the report has been communicated to the House Standing Committee of Legal Affairs. It would be an omission not to mention the role, the role that this report plays in delivering messages to candidate states against a global landscape of exacerbate tension and violation of fundamental rights, it is essential to ensure that states aspiring to join the European Union understand the value that the Union and its citizens attribute to the rule of law and its unconditional implementation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dimitris. But please, dear colleagues, particularly those representing national parliaments, do have in mind that here in the European Parliament, Time is essential. We always have a, an issue with the uh, interpretation cabin, that's, that, that's for one thing. I mean, we are extremely limited about the slots we're getting from the administration and from the uh, interpretation cabin. So please, before having the floor, try to phrase your mind into one minute and a half maximum. Please try to phrase it. If you've got some script before your eyes, try to redraft it so that you can summarize it in one minute and a half, because otherwise we are in trouble to allocate all of the speaking times that we've got listed. Please, Mr. Vilsik, there you are representing the European Parliament for one minute, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, distinguished panelists and colleagues. Uh, it's very good to have this exchange indeed. Uh, it's important to discuss the rule of law in as wide a setting as possible, because what we need ultimately is the joint ownership uh, of this issue uh, across the uh, core EU institutions, including uh, the uh, national parliaments. Now, the uh, EPP group uh, has uh, long called for a mechanism that would assess uh, member states objectively on the integrity of the rule of law. Uh, and uh, we find the first report uh, published by the Commission a first good step in the right direction. But we need to do more. Uh, we do need to have uh, a legally binding mechanism uh, which would really um, uh, have the joint ownership of the Council and the Commission, the European Parliament, and of course the member states, including uh, the national parliaments, on uh, the uh, uh, annual assessment of the rule of law. And maybe this is my question to the panelists, particularly to the representative of the Council. Council, uh, what are the prospects for moving the dialogue which is going on right now in the Council to a real mechanism which would ensure that uh, we have uh, a real strong uh, uh, basis to defend the rule of law um, across the member states? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is okay. One minute. And uh, now let's move to the uh, next uh, tandem of uh, members of national parliaments. It will be Francesco Berti, della Camera dei Deputati, and then Vita Anda Terauda, Latvia, Seima. Please, Francesco Berti, Honorevole Berti, se lei è pronto, prego, la parola è sua. Honorevole Berti, proprio lì. Ecco, yes. la vediamo. La vedevamo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. From all over Europe, Mr. Renders and Vice President Barley. Uh, we welcome this meeting in order to analyze the process, the progress we made on the rule of law. And I have to say that Italy has, and my party, Five Star Movement, has pushed forward to fight the corruption uh, with very uh, strong uh, sanction, which might lead to the perpetual inability to close contract with the state in case of two or more years of condemnation. Uh, in crimes against the public administration, we now use to fight the corruption the same instrument we use to fight mafia. And uh, we are trying to reform the process, the criminal and civil proceeding, and also we are trying to reform the uh, self-governing body of the judiciary. Scusi, l'abbiamo perso. Può rimettere a posto il... 
We lost you there. Do you mind turning your mic on again? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Adesso, ecco, ancora. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, what I have to say that the investment here are very important. We need investment in order to hire more judge and digitalize the public administration. What I have to say here is that you cannot link, uh, since rule of law is not a political and a culture, and, uh, is not an administrative and a budgetary matter, rule of law is a matter of political and culture. This is why, to me, from my national perspective, uh, it might be useless to link money to rule of law, as it might be in linking the money from next generation EU to uh, rule of law, because uh, you cannot negotiate on values. You cannot impose values via economic incentive, uh, because you have to solve this political and moral problem via uh, culture and not via economic incentive. That's, well, that is my perspective from uh, the national point of view. Otherwise, you can uh, create an institutional conflict between Europe and national institution. Thank you, President Aguilar. Thank you so much. Now we move to the following, as I said, national parliament representation, which is Vita Anda Terauda, Latvia Seima. The floor is yours. Are you there? Yes, hello. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, we welcome very much the new uh, annual rule of law report. Uh, it is important uh, that this serves as a new benchmark for a common understanding about what rule of law is for the European Union. Overall, the report, while well done, it is a depressing read. It does show that through our own efforts to address rule of law concerns through dialogue alone, these efforts have not led to improvements in the situation. Even launching Article 7 procedures have not seemed to have had an impact as we can see in the rule of law report. I welcome the discussion at council level, but I have concerns that this discussion will be very prolonged. If concerns expressed in today's report are discussed only in 24 months in the council, this is too long for it to have a impact on the situation. I was heartened to see that our condition We lost you. We lost track. Can you reset, please? I'm sorry we lost track of you. We were having you, but now, now, not now. Can you re... Can you yes, re yes. Uh, yes. Please, if, yes. You finish, if you finish, if you finish, finish if you we finish. thank you. Three, three sentences and I will finish. Um, I welcome the progress on the conditionality for the MFF, even though the scope is much more narrow than I would have hoped. It does not do justice to the entire array of problems identified in the rule of law report. It is, however, a start to have a more serious mechanism for rule of law in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's move to the following MEP representative, which is Elena Yoncheva. If you are there, one minute. Please try to phrase it in one minute. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have very concrete questions. I will appreciate concrete answers. Uh, the first uh, question is to the Commission. The first annual reports don't provide for explicit ranking among the member states, putting aside Poland and Hungary, which are already on the Article 7 procedure. Could you please name the member states which need urgently to step up the reforms? As an example, very important one, I can give you Bulgaria. Well, the Prime Minister didn't say even one word, even one word on the substance of the European Parliament resolution on the rule of law in Bulgaria voted recently, as this resolution didn't exist at all. And because of the lack of media freedom, no journalist was allowed to ask him. Can you imagine this is happening in a country member of the European Union? So please, be concrete in this uh, 
uh, answer, naming the member states that need immediate decision to be taken apart from Poland and Hungary. Second question to the Commission. The reports reveal many challenges in the field of anti-corruption. However, during the last decade, the EU hasn't done much in this field. So do you plan to update to enhance the European Union anti-corruption legislation. And my third question is to the presidency. In some member states, the situation is beyond the part of discussion. It's about taking immediate decisions. So when the council will start to acting now, when there is a link between the rule of law and EU funding, can you be more specific about the follow-up of the plan discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let's move to the following tandem of national representation of members of parliament, getting started with Sofia Boruktesi, which is Greece. And then it'll be Carlos Hugo Fernandez Roca, Spain. Okay. Sofia, are you there? Ready and connected? The floor is yours. I hope you can hear me. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, say the interpreters. Ladies and gentlemen, chairman and members of the committee, I'd like to congratulate you for the very difficult work that you've done against the backdrop of COVID-19. The report, uh, this report is a very important tool for the future and for our national parliaments. This is a report that shouldn't end up in a drawer. And above all, this is a report that should bring us together and give us the opportunity to collect even more information from the member states on um, different sectors. I'd like to say that for many years Greece was in a very difficult uh, situation when it comes to budget discipline and it faced a multifaceted crisis that shook the whole of the EU and that was particularly bad in Greece because of the migration crisis which uh, uh, still persists. Now, despite this, we uh, adopted very ambitious legislation to fight against corruption and in order to improve the situation regarding to the rule of law. And we're very grateful that you recognize this in the Commission report, which will be discussed in our committee and in the Hellenic Parliament. Thank you very much and greetings from Athens. Okay, thank you. Now. Okay. Carlos Hugo Fernández Roca, por favor. Carlos Hugo Fernández Roca, are you connected? Do you have one and a half minutes? I see you're not connected. Mm -hmm. We should move to the following uh, national member of parliament ready to go. It'll be Teresa Comodini Caccia, Malta. Malta, Teresa Comodini Caccia. I don't know how it's pronounced. Told I'm not allowed to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. Thank you for the floor, dear colleague. I must start by commending the European Parliament for its work on the rule of law within the European Union. And the work of the Parliament, as well as that of the European Commission, has certainly rekindled the realization of how important it is for us as a union to retain the rule of law as one of our fundamental principles. For this value to remain remain at the core of the Union, each member state and the member states. We really need both the national parliaments as well as the European institutions to fulfil their role. For this reason, I really appreciate and express my appreciation for this interparliamentary meeting to have been taking place and to be called at such a close time, really close to the publication of the first annual rule of law report itself. I wish to stress how important it is that the Parliament, the European Parliament and national parliaments continue to work closely together to ensure that as Europeans we continue to retain this value and also to be able to take such action that may become necessary in a timely manner. Allow me to refer to the report itself. It is regrettable that the report for Malta does not give due weight and does not contain a clear reference to threats to journalism and to journalists, especially those reporting on high-level corruption. 
We cannot underestimate the effects on independent media that political discourse has. We cannot underestimate the obstacles and threats, be they direct or indirect, which journalists face. And one of the best ways to support independent media and journalists is to call out the threats that they face and clearly state that these are unacceptable. With so many independent media houses now even facing lack of revenue due to COVID-19 pandemic, our role continues to be in ensuring that they continue to function effectively and efficiently. Thank you, and I encourage an ongoing and continued dialogue between national parliaments and European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sophie Inveld, MEP. Are you ready to make it in one minute? Please. Are you ready, connected? The floor goes yes, to you. Yes, I'll, I'll do my best, Chair, but it's, it's a big topic. And uh, having taken the initiative behind this report six years ago, I feel particularly attached to it. Uh, I'm also very pleased we're having this exchange with national parliaments, and that Mr. Reinders is going to visit the national uh, parliaments, because that was our original idea, that national parliaments uh, should be part of this pact. I hear a terrible echo. Hear that too? Okay, this is better, I think. Thank you. Yes. So um, it's interesting that we all, I think, in the world uh, experience how democracy is actually very vulnerable against attacks from the inside. And in this respect, I think our debate should feed into the global summit, which has been announced by President-elect Joe Biden, uh, the global summit on democracy that he will organize uh, next year. Now, the, the annual report, the first annual report is extremely extremely welcome, uh, but as uh, Michal Simetska has said, it also needs to be further elaborated and uh, expanded. It's not the only tool. Conditionality, which we have just agreed on, uh, is the other tool, uh, and that has to kick in from day one of the new budget period. So this is not about sanctions that have to be uh, uh, considered for a long time. Every cent, every penny uh, for, of EU, uh, the EU budget that is spent has to meet the criteria, the rule of law criteria. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this. I'm very pleased that, that we are having this first debate, uh, and I hope this is going to be an annual event. Thank you. Please, please, again, we are trying to cover the whole ground. So get everybody who is listed on board, but please try to phrase it the minimum because there should be some opportunity to reply to the guest speakers we had, at least for, for a minute each or a, couple, a minute and a half each, and there were five. So please uh, try to help us out, because even if we get the generosity of the interpreters, it'll be uh, really hard to, 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 to make it according to the limited slots that we've been having for, for our works for some time now. So please, now let's move to... Nathalie Gibson, which is representative of the Belgium Chambre de Députés. Nathalie Gilson, Nathalie Gilson, vous êtes là? Vous avez la parole. Are you there, Nathalie Gilson? You have the floor. Representing Belgium. Are you connected? Yes. Okay, so um, I also want to congratulate the Commission uh, for this first annual report and uh, Commissioner Renders for this very important uh, work. I think it's very interesting that every country uh, can examine it and uh, see what uh, can be uh, shared as best practices and what can be also uh, modified, and, and uh, some colleagues about, uh, have spoken about that. Uh, concerning uh, Belgium, um, this afternoon the new government is uh, presenting his new uh, political uh, agenda. So uh, regarding what is noted in the report on Belgium, there are new means, financial means, to increase uh, digitalization and to increase the means of the justice. Uh, I welcome the idea that uh, Commissioner Renders will come to the Parliament and discussed uh, with the Parliament about it. Uh, I had some um, 
thoughts about digitalization, which is very important for the functioning of the justice, of course. But on the other hand, we should not forget that justice should also keep a human uh, side. And sometimes it is important that uh, you can meet your own judge and that there is a, a dialogue uh, and mediation. And you, we should not also forget uh, the problem of the digital um, issue that some of the population is still uh, in a fracture digital, we call it in French. So I would like to know what is the vision of the commissioner as regards the, the digitalization of justice in this uh, uh, view. And I'm here uh, with my colleague, Kurt Gaines, former minister of Belgium as well in the delegation. Thank you. Now, Thank you. let's move to the final track of members of the European Parliament which are listed. Please make it in one minute each so that we can hear from the speakers we had in the first place. Wendolin Delbos Corfield, Greens. You make it in one minute if you are there. Yep. Yes. Hello. Thank you. This is a very uh, useful and important debate with the national parliaments, and it's a pity we only have one minute to give our hopes and concerns, but we do understand it. So very, very quickly, first, um, we need now these uh, national parliaments to take ownership of this report. We have been debating it and working on it in the European Parliament. We have told the Commission how important this work has been. Now we really need it to be used in the national uh, context. Um, rule of law has to become a necessary more important than European semester, more important than other things, and as important as European funds or financial questions. The debate on rule of law needs to exist in every parliament. It's a good thing that Didier Reinders is going everywhere, and hopefully um, every year it will become more important, this debate. Secondly, we need solidarity and support for the associations that gave the data for this, this report. Um, in some member states, they have been attacked uh, by, by the governments, they have been attacked by media, they have been uh, threatened to be deprived from their money, so we need the Commission and the national parliaments everywhere to stick to support the associations because we were happy to found the data that provided this report. And then third, uh, Michael Roth, Commissioner, uh, Council, President, German President, he said it, um, this is only one, one tool, other tools exist, and this is not a substitution to Article 7 process. Since this report, things have been worsening in Hungary and in Poland, um, in Hungary about independence of justice, in Poland about the situation of women, and in both cases, uh, Article 7 uh, is not completely used. And we need national parliaments to push the governments and to push uh, the council to act uh, for European citizens everywhere to have uh, rights and liberties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the next floor goes to Patrick Jackie, ECR. If you are connected, there you are. Patrick, please. Nope, not connected. Then we move on to Mr. Uh, excuse me, it'll be, yes, Sira Rego, Senora Sira Rego. Palabra final antes de volver a nosotros. Mrs. Regal, before we go back to our other speakers. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to say that this is a very positive report. We feel this is a valuable instrument. And if we take into account that the far right is gaining momentum and we've seen the po Polish women fighting against the uh, far right government and uh, battling for their rights, uh, it's extremely important. I'd like to ask Commissioner Reinders whether he thinks that these reports could also be used, say, for Frontex, you know, EU agencies. Now, a few days ago, a group of journalists with journalists from the Netherlands and Germany were publishing uh, their investigations uh, into Frontex and pushbacks uh, in illegal returns. So I'd like to know whether you think that this report could be extended to cover agencies such as Frontex in the future and to also uh, think about setting up mechanisms that could deal with the violations of human rights. Thank you. 
having heard from the members which are listed and before we move on to the second track to the second part of this gathering of this discussion which will be dealing with the covid emergency measures across the member states of the european union i think we should be back to our speakers the guest speakers if you will to react if they're feeling like reacting to some of the points that have been made let's say first of all Mikhail Roth, would you like to? Mikhail Roth, Minister Roth. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Well, I'll keep it short because I do get the impression that we actually agree to a large extent. This report represents an opportunity, as does the new mechanism. It should help us to come to a common understanding of what the rule of law means. I want to make it clear what's at stake for us. So far, we've had only one instrument available in the treaty, and that's the Article 7 procedure. It's currently being used with regard to Hungary and Poland. The German Council presidency plans to continue this, these procedures. Well, now we've got the negotiations between the Parliament 